Hard to believe homes once stood here, lives were lived, now apocalyptically empty, eerily quiet. In Oregon, entire neighborhoods reduced to gray dust. Overwhelming for Ashley, whose home this is. Some compare the wildfires to an imagined scene from hell, only this isn't the future. It's very raw and very real. It's the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. It's, I had seen videos, but it's a thousand times worse than I could have ever imagined. A red flag warning that means as painful as this is, things could get worse as strong winds are due to blow through today and potentially fan the flames. Ten people are known to have died in Oregon so far, while across the west coast from Washington state to California, at least 35 have lost their lives to wildfires that have burned faster and farther than ever before. As people search for missing loved ones, the state's governors and some locals blame climate change. There's something going on, that's for sure, man, because it's one thing after another. Every summer we we're burning up, so I don't know. Oh my God. Throughout Oregon, firefighters are struggling to contain more than 30 active wildfires, the largest of which is more than 55 miles wide. And smoke pollution has left the state's largest city, Portland, with the worst air quality in the world. Down the west coast in California, more people are now leaving the state than returning as wildfires rip through at least three million acres, leaving charred rubble in their wake. As America burns, Donald Trump defied the governor's orders and held an indoor rally in Nevada yesterday where he blamed the fires on poor forest management. While today, the president who once referred to climate change as a hoax will visit California to witness the historic devastation for himself. The man who wants to beat him to the presidency was unequivocal. With every bout with nature's fury caused by our own inaction on climate change, more, more Americans see and feel the devastation, whether in a big city, small towns, on coastlines or in farmlands. It's happening everywhere, and it's happening now, and it affects us all. But this isn't just an American problem. Carbon emissions and rising temperatures are the planet's problem. From Siberia to the Amazon, acres are up in smoke. Mother Nature's not so subtle way of telling the world that something urgently has to change. And in more evidence of the rapid pace of climate change, a huge chunk of Greenland's ice cap has broken off in the northeastern Arctic. A 42 square mile section of glacier came off a fjord at the end of the northeast Greenland ice stream, where it flows right into the ocean. The scientists say that they were very concerned that it appeared to show progressive disintegration. But environmental catastrophe is not just someone else's problem. It is happening right here in Britain too. Tomorrow, the United Nations will report on global attempts to save the natural world. But as David Attenborough highlighted last night, the outlook is looking bleak. Our chief correspondent, Alex Thompson, has this report. Curlews have long inspired artists and poets and musicians. That's why it's forged such a strong connection with people. Even if they don't necessarily know what it is, it's, it's, it's such an atmospheric, haunting sound that it, it stays with you. The haunting call of a bird fast becoming a ghost in our landscape. Here on the salt marshes of the Locker Estuary near Swansea, the echo of the curlew hints at a scene now long gone. What we're looking for is curlew. So all the way out on this estuary, we've got the curlew. So they're brown birds about that big, and they're big brown birds with these long, long beaks. <laughs> I can see, I can see a curlew with my own eyes. Yeah. It's right What's over it there doing? Somewhere. All it's doing is this. So we've seen them out here now. Can you see loads of them? Or is yeah. it just a few? Just one. Just one? I can just see one. So when I was your age and I was really, really small, I used to see hundreds of them. So they used to be all across here. You'd hear loads of noise of curlew. Can you hear any now? And they make like a toot, 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 toot. 
Did you know there's only one um, white tiger in the whole world? Really? Yeah, one left. One left. So that's the way the curlew would go in. So when you've got things like tigers, rhinos, orangutans, we've got things like curlew that can be added to that because there's not that many of them left anymore. We think of extinctions as someone else's problem, somewhere far away, but they're happening on our doorstep, on our watch. 67 UK birds are on the extinction red list. Curlews joined them in 2015. Their decline mostly caused by intensified farming over the past 50 years, leaving little space for curlews to breed. It's considered the highest priority species in Britain now for, for conservation work and action. Unfortunately, among the wider public, it's really not known about as a, as a problem. And in fact, that could be said of, of biodiversity decline in general. Urgent action is needed. Really high proportion of species now are in decline in Britain. The UK is one of the most nature depleted countries in the world. The State of Nature report last year revealed strong or moderate decline in 41% of all our species, with more than one in seven threatened with extinction. And if we look globally, a WWF report last week showed that on average the populations of birds, mammals, amphibians and reptiles have plummeted more than two-thirds in the last half century. The UN says life on this planet is vanishing faster now than at any point in human history. And all this despite world governments coming together in Aichi, Japan a decade ago and setting 20 global targets to ensure nature's protection by this year. It was a major moment, the first time so many had come so far to promise so much. Really major pledges to halt extinctions, to take real meaningful action on critical areas like deforestation and pollution, to safeguard our biosphere from the threats of humankind. And yet, frankly, 10 years on, the picture is dire. Even by the British government's own admission, it has missed more than two thirds of its targets. One area where the world reports some progress is in designating at least 17% of land and 10% of sea to be protected, conserved and managed effectively for nature. The UK has exceeded this target, but some say it's just labelling. The actual condition of the reserves is far from healthy. This is a protected area. On paper, the wash is seen as being in favourable condition. Two million birds every year will pass through here. From all over the world, then? Yeah, coming, yeah. You know. It's the largest uh, and most important estuary in the UK. It's also one of the most important wetlands in Europe. Since 2010, um, Natural England, they're the organisation that are responsible for doing the monitoring on sites such as this, their funding has been slashed. So it means that there's less of them to do the work and unfortunately the monitoring of these special places has uh, dropped down the list of priorities. And if you don't monitor, you don't know what's going on? Exactly. So Redshank is a really good example of how you know, this, this lack of monitoring can end in disaster really for a species. Half of the UK's population, they use salt marsh to breed in. Across the UK, there's been a decline of about 53% in, in red shank breeding on uh, salt marsh. Over what sort of time scale? Uh, between 1985 and 2011. Well, that's pretty catastrophic. It is, it's awful. Um, but that's not the worst of it, because here on the wash, some of the areas, we actually see a decline of almost 80%. So on our reserves, we're trying to do things that will help the red shank, but that's only small pockets, and we need to cover this whole wide landscape to try and reverse the declines. This isn't solely about the plight of another bird. It shows the ecological crisis gripping the globe. Next year, delayed by COVID, governments convene at the COP, a UN conference seen by many as a last chance to set and hit targets for this decade. But given the collective global failure of what happened at Aichi, how will this time be any different? In some ways, we didn't have the science to know how ambitious we needed to be. Uh, we didn't have enough data to really tell us how, how critical the biodiversity crisis is and indeed how interlinked the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis are. The new sets of targets are going to be developed in a way that takes on board the commitments of all of those groups. So we realise that governments cannot do it alone. It has to be everybody working together. Covid highlights our emergency. 
the urgency of tackling our biodiversity crisis. Our destruction of the natural world transmits pandemics, moving viruses from animals to humans. So saving nature is all about saving ourselves. In the middle of the last century, we didn't realise the problems that we were causing ourselves in the future. We have realised now, but we're failing to do enough about it. It's a time when we really should be putting more and more effort into protecting our environment. That's the environment for our children and our children's children. So why do you think it's important that we save animals and save things like the curlew? Yeah? Because if, if every animal went extinct, we wouldn't be able to stay alive. Exactly. Because if, say now, if bees went extinct, all the plants wouldn't be pollinated. So what about you guys? There's only a few of you here. What if all your friends got involved as well? If everyone in the world did a tiny bit to help, then every little help. You'd save everything. Environmental head of issues. OK, all right. You join us in this gorgeous, if threatened, place as the sun sets here in Frampton Marsh. Now, today, the government said that these issues are among the great challenges of our time, which is committed to addressing. They did not, however, make a minister available to speak about such issues on tonight's programme. But the government did offer up Tony Juniper, who is the chair of Natural England, which is the official body that works for the conservation and restoration of the natural environment in England. I began by asking him if he would have been more critical of the government had he still been working at the World Wildlife Fund. One of the things that I would have said when I worked at WWF and which I still say today is around the extent to which the conservation tools that we've been using for, for the last 70 or 100 years, they're no longer sufficient on their own. What we've been doing is focusing on the protection of the last fragments of good quality habitat that are left. We've been focusing on very rare species and trying to stop them disappearing completely. And that's been essential, but on its own, it's not sufficient. And I would say that this signals the moment when we have to move beyond where we've been, protecting the last little bits that are left, and to now move into an ambitious program of nature recovery. But as we've just heard in Alex Thompson's report, this very stretch of water here on the Lincolnshire banks of the Wash is actually a protected area according to Natural England. And it is not being monitored. How can you have a protected area that's not being monitored? Well, this has been one of the consequences of successive funding cuts is that we've been unable to field the staff to be able to do some of the basics. And we were very pleased this year to have a modest increase in our budget to be able to plug some of these gaps. And I'm hoping that during the course of the spending review that ministers will see the need to invest much, much more than what has hitherto been the case in this programme of nature recovery. And the reason I would say that to ministers is not because we want to spend more on the environment, it's because these are investments in the future of the country. Well, nations come together next year in um, COP15. How do you guarantee that the targets set are actually legally binding? That surely is the only way we're going to reverse what's going on at the moment. Well, part of my previous life at Friends of the Earth, where I, I ran the campaign with my colleagues there for the Climate Change Act, and one of the things that we saw as important then was to have legally binding national targets to be able to ensure that the baton was passed between successive governments, because these long-term issues, they need long-term attention. And so it goes on the recovery of nature as well. And this is one of the things that I'm very excited about in the Environment Bill, because we will have legally binding targets, including for the recovery of nature, enshrined in law as a result of that new Act of Parliament. It's all very positive, but in all conscience, in the age of COVID, what really are the chances that you're going to get any more money or any more action out of the government? Well, I think one thing that has come from the COVID pandemic is, is a realisation that some of these things that were talked about as risks, climate change, biodiversity loss, and indeed pandemics, they are real. And this pandemic has its roots in environmental abuses, the wildlife trade, factory farming, deforestation, the hunting of bushmeat. All of these things increase our risk of, of diseases jumping from the natural world into humans. And of course, at the same time, we've all been benefiting from being in places like where you are today, John. And I think all of these things, they come together in a way 
where we find the environment and the natural environment being something that we logically do focus on now. So this is a moment that's replete with opportunity. And I am an optimist, John. We have the tools, we have the ambition, and we have the means to get through the other side in a way we're going to see nature recovering rather than through further decline. Tony Juniper, thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, John. Nice to see you. Well, I'm joined now at the Frampton Marsh Reserve by Becky Spate, who is the chief executive of the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds, which owns this site, and by the environmental economist Matthew Agarama uh, from the University of Cambridge. Um, Becky Spate, tomorrow's UN report is thought to highlight some of the successes in rolling, up, rolling back the assaults on biodiversity. But with global targets missed, and the UK having missed two-thirds of its targets, this is time to speak truth to power, isn't it? Absolutely. It's, it's incredible to stand somewhere as beautiful as this and think, actually, what we're witnessing is an absolute tragedy. So we've got nature in absolute freefall at the moment. Uh, the rates of extinction globally and in the UK are climbing faster than they've ever climbed before, particularly in the last 50 years. And we also know that the abundance of nature, so those common species that we all love and know really well, are also disappearing. So nature is in huge, huge trouble. And actually, we've got this one moment, I think, to turn it round. And yet, uh, Matthew Agarama, uh, Agala, Agawala, sorry, I got it wrong. Um, and yet, it, it, the, the fact is that it, in, in an age of COVID, there's no money. The government is going to say, I'm terribly sorry, but we've got to kill people before we kill the planet. Well, the reality is that uh, governments are strapped for cash at the moment, but investing in nature is the highest return, best economic strategy that we have at the moment. The returns to investing in urban green space, to investing in uh, low carbon, uh, resilient infrastructure are much, much higher than trying to prop up these outdated fossil fuel industries uh, that cause environmental problems like climate change But in the, the transition is, is, is now, and, and the quicker you make it, the more expensive the government will complain it is. They would complain that, but they would be wrong. In fact, it's exactly the opposite that's true. The sooner we get started, the sooner we start to learn how to develop solar panels that are more efficient, the sooner we start to develop uh, more efficient buildings that require less energy and less carbon emissions to uh, heat. And when we do that, the costs of these renewable energies will collapse. And we've seen over the past 10 years, the cost of renewable energies fall by 85%. And we've seen the use of renewable electricity rise from 5% of the UK market to 35% of the UK market over the past decade. Well, let, let's go right to the heart of what we're doing here. Uh, what are the threats that you're dealing with? I mean, you're dealing with extinction in the terms of the red shanks and various other birds. Yeah. Um, I mean, how do you combat them and how do you do so without massive government funding? Because we now learn there's no funding coming in here at all. Well, it's, it's a systemic approach that we need. So we know that we've got wildlife species under threat of extinction and we know we've got common species becoming less common. We also know that, crucially, the habitats on which those species depend are being really fragmented, really shrunk. Here we sit right on the edge of England here on the Wash and you know it, this is an oasis really and so what we need to do is to take a systemic approach where we're looking not only at the kind of leadership that we need from our governments both globally and here domestically as well but we really want to look at those systemic changes so I'm talking about things like agriculture, things like fishing, things like how we do our planning and our urbanisation, looking at all of those and making sure that nature's recovery is built into all of them. Because if we don't tackle the biodiversity crisis alongside the climate crisis, then really all is lost. It won't just be people who love nature who are really facing into this tragedy, it will be all of us. Dr Agarwala, the fact is that you, there are you, an environmental economist, how do you explain to government the point that you're making that is in fact far cheaper on the taxpayer if you speed this thing up than well, if you don't because clearly people think quite the opposite. Well the pandemic provides uh, an unambiguous test case. The costs of this global pandemic are astronomical and it is caused by the degradation of nature. 
It is caused by the a incursion. Direct link. There's, there are direct links between the incursion of human settlements into wild spaces, and this can increase the possibility of zoonotic disease jumps like the coronavirus. And that so has a huge cost. these two issues have collided. They, ha they are and colliding now. They have collided. And environmental destruction. Yes. Amazing. These, these issues are linked. Just explain that very quickly. When humans interact more and more with wild, previously wild spaces, there's more interaction. There are more opportunities for diseases to jump from wildlife to humans. And that's a problem for us. The way that we develop our food systems means that we increase the risk of these species jumps from wildlife to humans. My God, we've got to get that message over. And I'm wondering what you make of that. I, I couldn't agree more. So we want to basically have a healthier world. We want to have a world where our economy is more resilient to the kind of things that it's go are going to be thrown at us from climate change, from this kind of pandemic. And we want to make sure that we're in a world where nature can thrive because our whole, our whole living system is built on nature and is built on the, th the kind of things that climate change is threatening right now. And if we don't get those systems fixed now, then we can kind of wave goodbye to a decent future for our kids. Isn't there a danger that the UN report out tomorrow, which we're making a lot of song and dance about, because well, we, we ought to, we need to find out what's going on, is going to be celebrating what they've done rather than dealing with the far greater sum of stuff which hasn't been done. Well, I think the great thing is that we do know what we need to do. We're not stood here thinking that we just don't know how to tackle this. We know what we need to do, and that's what the UN report is probably trying to highlight. But what we need to do is much more of it. We need much greater funding, and we need to have governments that are really committed to legally binding targets, globally, domestically, to make this happen. Does this leave you an optimist? <laughs> I could become an optimist if we see from governments the kind of leadership that will pull us away from our fossil fuel-based economy and bring us towards a resilient green recovery from the pandemic.